let's um, dive into understanding the linear regression and let's for a start focus on the table in the middle. So um, let's call our summary again and let's for a start focus on this very table. Okay, there is the p-value here. This here is the p-value and if you would be a normal statistician, statistician who doesn't care for anything else, you would say, ah, the p-value here is bigger than 0.05. I didn't find something significant and you would wrap up and call it a day. Um, however, there is in the statistical community a far too p-value centered focus and there are other values which are in many people's opinion even more meaningful than the p-value. So generally people say if the p-value is smaller than 0.05 then I found something, if it's bigger then I didn't find something and that's it. However we don't want to do that, we don't want to focus simply on the p-value um, but we want to focus on other things and one important thing is for example the effect size. So Alan Downey here, from which some of the, um, of the stuff we're dealing with here is also based, argues that the most important parameter is the effect size. So how strong does a factor influence the result? All right, and in our table here, this effect size is the actual coefficient. And what this effect size here means is it answers the question how much a change in x of a step of 1 changes um, uh, so if we make a step if we make a step of size 1 in x direction how much of a change do we have in the y direction and depending on the units and the problem um, it depends what a, a sufficiently large effect size large effect size is but you may notice that well, if you for a step into the x direction, you make a step of, of one. So for a step of one into the x direction, if you make a step of y uh, into the y direction of 0 0.001, then probably um, this doesn't mean much. Okay, actually, let me remove this bad fit and replace it by our earlier fit here. Um, which we had here. So let's create new data and a new fit here. So now we see that for um, a step of size 1 into the x direction leads to a change of y of around 2. And if we look at our data here, um, we see that the slope here is rather high, so this is a, a meaningful effect size. So if this would be a value of 0, 0.0 something, that would not be sufficiently large. Okay, And where do we find the, expect, uh, the, um, the effect size? Well, it's simply the one which is not our intercept in our fit.params. Okay, so for every increase of 1 in x, I get an effect in y of 2 in this case. Depends totally on unit and domain. Um, and yes, so one real life example for here is that you may figure out, for example, that with a really high p value, you write consistently faster if you use another keyboard layer. However, if the effect size of that is only five seconds in five hours that you're saving using your new keyboard layer, then the fact that then, yes, this may be statistically uh, significant. And if you test it with enough samples, you will reach statistical significance even with this five seconds in five hours. However, it is not actually significant because these five seconds in five hours don't help you much. Okay, so effect size arguably one of the most important parameters of your um, result. Next, also I'm explaining this before the p-value, so I think still a really important value, and that is the explained variable, variance. 
This explained variance r squared can be seen as the standardized effect size, describing how much variance got explained by our model. Okay, so this is um, the formula is this. So we want to ask how much variance is left in the residuals after we applied the our model, and that's also listed in our table here as r squared. So using our model here, um, let me plot that again. So our model here, our linear model explains 97% of the variance in the data, which is apparently rather good, right? So we only have 3% of variance in our data left after um, so in the residual so in the difference of the points to our fitted line okay we can also show this expand variables using c1 so we have these two joint plots the first one is x versus y and the second one is x versus the residuals of our fit so we can simply call fit.resid and we see now that this here is um, the variance so the variation of the data in the x-axis and this here is pretty good uniformly distributed and this here is the variation of our data in the y-axis so it's a bit screwed but believe me it's uniformly distributed as well i mean we sampled it from uniform distribution and now after that so after, if we only take into account our residuals this here is the um, variation left in our y-axis it's a lot smaller because they vary only in this small window and we see it's it looks roughly normally distributed and this is good because we said that the errors which are left are normally distributed and now we see where a lot of the variance is explained by our model and the one that is left is um, normally distributed so we see that our model was apparently a good uh, explanation for um, why the points are scattered the way they are. Okay, so we figure out the explained variance by, for example, plotting only the residuals. Like I said, plotting is just as important as looking at the numbers. And then we see if the variance of the y values becomes very small, um, we can, we notice that our model was a good fit. And here we noticed a strong effect because 97 of our variance was explained away so our model almost completely explained the data so this is um, to give you a real life example again I, first of all how do we calculate it ourselves so what does stats models use to calculate it well what we simply do is we use the formula i explained to you above so r squared is simply one minus the variance of the residuals divided by the variable variance of the original uh, distribution in the y direction and this here gives a value of 0 0.970, which is the exact same result as um, stats models calculated in, calculated in our fit. So this is the formula stats models also used. Okay, so to give you an intuition again about uh, R squared, so for example, if you wanted to predict the stock market, um, then you would not be able, so we would never have an explained variance uh, an R squared value of 97% because that's the thing about the stock market even if you find um, some significant uh, models then these models will only explain a tiny amount of the actual variation in the stock market because the stock market depends on many 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 unpredictable um, features Next up, we want to look at the standard error and the confidence intervals, which are methods of confidence or uncertainty um, for our data, and which are also the ones which are used by classical statisticians. statisticians. Um, so, in classical frequency statistics, if we want to ask the question of how certain we are about the parameters we found, we will look at them. We will look at the standard error and at the confidence intervals. 
We're also going to look at that here. However, because these measures are good because they describe our uncertainty towards the effect size that is due to sampling error, where the sampling error is basically the error introduced. It's not an error, but it's um, a mismatch introduced by uh, the fact that our sample does not correctly um, encode our underlying distribution. So if we only draw, so if the mean of our sample is different than the mean of our underlying population, then this is a sampling. This, and the difference in these means is the sampling error. Okay, so normally in classical frequentist statistics, these two measures are derived in an analytic way using um, a bunch of tests. However, what we are doing here is we're doing statistics for hackers. Uh, so we are um, trying to use a computational method to calculate and also understand the standard error and the confidence interval. And to do that, we need the new concept of the sampling distribution. So what is the sampling distribution? It is the distribution of a statistics based on various samples of the same distribution. And now the sampling distribution is what is subject to the famous central limit theorem, which states that the sampling distribution will converge to a normal distribution given enough samples, irrespective of what the underlying distribution is. So the underlying distribution doesn't need to be normal for the sampling distribution to become normal given enough samples. Um, so one good example of um, for the sampling distribution is the mean computed on samples from a normal distribution. However, the central limit theorem only applies to the sampling distribution. Okay, so if you draw infinitely many samples from a beta distribution, then what you're getting is obviously still the beta distribution. Only their statistics, like for example, the sample mean will be normally distributed. So only if you draw infinitely many samples from a beta distribution and from these samples, so for example, you always take three samples from the beta distribution and calculate the mean of these three samples that the distribution of this mean, the sampling distribution, that will be normally distributed because this is um, well, what the central limit theorem is about. So let me show you that with this figure here. So no matter what your original distribution was, if you take three samples and take the mean of these samples, this is how it's going to look. And if you take five and if you take 10 and if you take 20, um, the width of this distribution will get lower because well, if you would have, if you would take all of uh, the, so if you would take your entire population and calculate the mean based on your entire population, then obviously your mean is only one value. And this value is precisely at the mean of your population. But um, if you only take a few samples, then your mean is uh, skewed because you could take three, if you take, I don't know, height of people and could take three very tall people in your one sample. This is why it's uh, more likely that outliers are existent here than here, which is why the um, distributions here uh, have uh, uh, lower variance, the more samples you have. But yeah, so let's uh, do that. Let's draw random samples from one distribution, namely for the norm from the normal distribution here. And to do that, let's first instantiate the distribution and then call the method RVS uh, on this distribution object. And we can use that by um, doing this. And now we draw five samples from this normal distribution. And then when we repeatedly sample from the same normal distribution, saving only the means, then this means will be our sampling distribution. And then if we look at this, um, the sampling distribution, so the distribution of the means of our normally distributed sample will look normally distributed. 
thanks to the central limit theorem. So note that while here we explicitly say, hey, I want a normal distribution, normally we cannot sample, for, so we only get these samples from our original distribution and we do not know the underlying distribution in the real world. So we only have heights of people and we can only draw samples of people not knowing what the underlying distribution is. So we, the only distribution which we can get meaningfully if we are conducting experiments is the sampling distribution. Now the nice thing about our statistics for hackers approach is that we can calculate the um, standard error and the confidence interval from our sampling distribution. Okay. So what is the standard error? The standard error is in fact the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. The standard error answers so the standard error answers the question how much do sample individual samples differ? So given our normal distribution, so given our population, how much will a sample on average the sample mean be on average different from the uh, mean of the underlying population. So what the standard error is, if you think about it, and if you do the statistics and calculate it, it again makes sense. The standard error is only the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. It describes how much we expect to be off on average when we do our experiment. So it only tells us something about the variability of our experimental procedure due to sampling and doesn't make any statement about the true parameter. Now, if we now calculate here the standard error being the standard deviation of our sampling distribution of means and um, we plot um, the mean plus and minus our standard error, this is uh, where we get. Okay, so the error you get when measuring not the whole but just the sample is the sampling error and that's what well, we're trying to quantify here. So if we made a new experiment with 20 people, the sampling error asks us the question of how much we would expect the new mean to deviate on average. So it's a measure of certainty in our parameters. The, cloud, the smaller our sampling error is, the um, well, smaller the distribution of our means here, the closer the distribution of our means here is, and the more likely it is that if we draw another sample, it will have the same or a close mean to our one now. And then the confidence intervals can be computed as, percenti as percentiles of the sampling distribution. So, uh, for example, we want the 2.5 and 97.5 percentiles. And the standard error here reads, we believe that 95% of times where we measure the mean, it will be around the respective values for the confidence intervals. Okay, so they are a complementary way to quantify uncertainty due to sampling error. And this 95% confi confidence interval tells us that if we repeat the experiment, the computed parameter will fall into the confidence interval in 95% of cases. So this is precisely what we're doing here. We're making the sampling distribution again. And then we simply, well, if we want to have a confidence interval of 95%, we're going to take the 2.5 percent edges uh, to the respective left and right side and then we get the percentiles for that so the 2.5 percent percentile and the 97.5 percent percentile and now this gives this gives us two values again and if we plot them in blue here we see so if you would calculate you would see that 95 percent of values are in between these blue lines and five so 2.5 percent of values are here and 2.5 percent of values are here okay so we believe that 95 percent of times where we measure the mean it will be in between these two blue lines okay now that you know these two concepts um we're working with uh 
So you have an exercise again, and that is uh, that you're supposed to calculate the standard error and the confidence intervals for the mean of the normal distribution um, around 10. How does the smaller variance of the underlying distribution influence the measures of sampling error? Okay, so let's, um, first of all, let's create the distribution here. So distribution equals stats dot norm with a location of 10 and a scale of one. This is what we wanted here. And then let's take uh, 1000 samples with a sample size of 20. And then let's make our sampling distribution of means as we did before. So n samples, so 1000 times we want to draw 20 random values, calculate the mean of that, and append that to our sampling distribution of means. And then using our sample, so after this loop, we have calculated our sampling distribution of means. And then we can simply calculate the standard error as the standard deviation of our sampling distribution of means. And the confidence interval, we can uh, reuse the function we created here to calculate the respective um, 2.5 and 97.5 bounds. Okay, and then, well, we can simply print the standard error and the confidence intervals here. So the, can the standard error here is 0.2 and the confidence intervals are here. And if we um, plot this stuff again, we see that now the entire distribution, so now it ranges from let's say 9.5 to 10.5 and here it ranged um, well, from 9 point something to 10.9 or something. So we see it got closer here. So if our underlying population has less variance, so has our experiment, so has our sampling distribution and thus we are more confident in our parameters. So if all people would be of the same height, then going by the definition of um, what I told you earlier about uh, the standard error, well, then if we, and if we take, for example, a, trend, a sample of 20 people, so if everybody in the population would be one meter high uh, and we would draw a sample of 20 people and they're all one meter high because everybody's one meter high tall, uh, and this will this will give us a standard error of zero, which means, well, if you make another experiment where you take twenty people, then they will deviate by zero because these twenty people you will measure are also twenty meters, are uh, also one meter tall. Okay, so the lower the variance in our underlying distribution, the lower the variance in our sampling distribution, the more confident we are in our parameters. So the smaller variance does influence the sampling error and makes it smaller. Next up, bootstrapping. So the thing is, if we had access to the underlying distribution, there would be no reason for doing the stuff we do, because why would we, we are trying to make inferences for the underlying distribution using our samples here? And in bootstrapping, what we're doing is we're resampling our samples. So it's expensive to draw samples. So if you do experiments, it's expensive to get VPs and to test them. So in bootstrapping, what we're doing is we're reusing our samples. So drawing samples from the analytic distribution is not an option for real experiments. So we are limited to a single um, or more samples from the population. And then bootstrapping allows us to build a model of the, popula of the population starting from a single sample. So we simply resample. So we generate new sums by drawing with replacement from our real sample. And this then works like this. So um, from our data, we calculate a model of the population. And using this model of the population, we create arbitrarily many new simulated data. And using the original one as well as the simulated data, we can then create sample statistics. And using these sample statistics, we can estimate the effect size 
then we can talk about the sampling distribution of the sample statistic, as for example the sampling error or the confidence interval. So we will now bootstrap new samples and fit a new linear regression each time to get a sampling distribution um, for the slopes of our fit here. So let's do that. Um, let's look at our summary of the fit again. And now let's create a sampling distribution here um, by resampling, and that is simply we call data.sample with replace equals true. And we always draw, so if our original sample had um, one, so if originally we had 1000 elements in our sample, now we draw um, new samples of size 1000 again. And then from this, we um, uh, fit our model using ordinary d squares and we get our params. So for example, as param here, we want to get x. Okay, so um, this is the value we want to get. And now we're using bootstrapping to extract this x here from our bootstrap samples from our sampling distribution. Okay, so this here then gives us a sampling distribution of slopes because we're extracting the slopes from our bootstrap new samples. Okay, so let's do that. And now let's plot our sampling distribution of slopes here. This takes a bit of time because um, 1000 times we are resampling our data and fitting a linear model on, onto that. This takes some time. And now we see that this here is our new sampling distribution of slopes. And if we look at the standard deviation and at the 95% confidence interval from this, um, we see that this here is the standard error, which is the same one as we calculated ourselves. And the confidence interval here ranges from 1.9 to 2.03, which is the same as we calculated manually. So we see that using bootstrapping, we landed almost the same values than if we calculated the respective sampling statistics manually. And thus we um, note that bootstrapping is a valid way of generating samples. Okay, and now uh, it's time for an exercise again, and we're working with the fit tips data set here. So with the tips data set again, where we already had our fit. Now you're supposed to recalculate the standard error and the 95% confidence interval um, of the slope of tip um, from the total build using bootstrapping. And then you can um, ask yourself if they are the same values as um, the ones here. All right, so I hope you thought about this for a bit. Let me We'll show that to you now and let's um, get our sampling distribution here again. Um, we're running this 1,200 times, so this will take some time. Um, in the end, we will see that they are roughly the same than Stats model gives us here. So standard error here is 0 0.0112, whereas Stats model says it's 0 0.007. And the confidence intervals here are 0 0.0. 8 until 0.12. So they are not precisely the ones as stats models. And they are, uh, so they're close, but they're a bit larger than what stats model says. And we will later see why that is. Okay, so we are um, overestimating here. Um, and we will in a few minutes see why we are overestimating here.